Look at these two heater blocks. Can you tell the difference between them? Look closer. Okay, here's a clue. One is heavier than the other. If you haven't already guessed, allow me to introduce to you E3D's new copper alloy heater blocks. I know, copper, right? Well, come on, you should know that copper is a very good conductor of heat. So much so that I have thrown my gold heater blocks away and given up asking E3D to start making diamond heater blocks. And the guys at E3D have also coupled this with the same copper alloy V6 nozzles in 14 variants covering both 1.75 and 3mm filament sizes. The copper alloy used offers a resilience to metal softening point well above 500C, so we should expect durable nozzles comparable to the standard brass nozzles readily available. In addition, these are also nickel coated, which minimizes filament adhesion during print cycles, particularly on higher temperatures of 300C, and of course I think you'll also agree they look damn cool in nickel. During the QSN episode, I reached out to E3D for help. They're local to me in Oxford, and I had a great time talking to the engineers. If you haven't seen that episode, please check it out here above. During this visit, they asked me if I would be interested in looking into copper products and give it the in-depth and impartial Nerdville review. And of course, any innovation in the 3D printed world, I had to jump at the chance. So we'll look at capturing some data for heat up times, print performance, and also sustaining temperatures over a period of time. In addition, I want to share with you the added value of using a genuine E3D silicon sock in the setup, which now has a new and improved design. Our bench test will be the normal default standard aluminium heater block combined with the brass nozzles as sold by all Prusa i3 Mark II. Okay, so what are my expectations? Well, let's try to understand thermodynamics here. So hold on to your hats, because here comes the science bit. The term to measure the property of heat absorption is called thermal conductivity, and the unit for this is measured in watts per meter Kelvin. But more to the point, mass is an important factor when measuring heat transfer in a material. The density of that material plays an important part. Take for example, if a swimmer represented the heat energy and the pool that the swimmer is in is a heater block, the difference between swimming through water is a lot easier than swimming through a goopy liquid like syrup, which is more dense. And this is known as the specific heat capacity whereby it measures the rate of heat up per mass which the units of measurement is defined by joules, the measurement of heat energy, kilogram, the measure of mass, and K, the increase of one degree Kelvin through this mass. The lower the value means the poorer the conductivity and the higher the value, the better the material is at transmitting that heat energy. So let's take for example aluminium. The thermal conductivity of aluminium is around 215 watts per meter Kelvin. And brass? is 109 watts per meter Kelvin. Copper, on the other hand, is measured at 385 watts per meter Kelvin. That's almost 55% more than that of aluminium, and 350% more of brass. This of course means that the absorption of heat is going to be a lot more rapid using copper. But, although the thermal conductivity is greater in copper, so is the mass, which means that more heat energy is required to get the copper up to working temperature. Remember that swimmer? Well, he has to work harder to swim through that gloopy liquid. Which is why we need to understand the specific thermal capacity of these materials and not just the thermal conductivity. But of course, with great thermal conductivity comes great responsibility. I mean, greater thermal loss. And this is where the silicon sock comes into its own by retaining this heat by also improving and maintaining the stored heat energy by reducing heat loss. So let's try to put this into a format that we can visualize and carry out some extensive testing to prove this. We'll carry out two tests. 
The first will be heat up times in every combination of these components and the second will be physical prints in each of the components in higher temperature plastics like PETG. The components we will cycle through are as follows. Aluminium copper heater blocks, brass and copper nozzles at 0.4mm extrusion and using 1.75mm filament sizes with or without a sock a temperature range from 180 degrees C to 280 degrees C in 20 degrees C increments. And to further show a complete test, the printer fan will be switched on and off at each of the set target temperatures. I have all the permutations that we can set with the various parts parameters for testing and this amounts to 96 separate tests. And of course, Octoprint will be the interface for me to time and monitor the heat ups. This is one of the reasons why I installed Octoprint on the Prusa so as to run more scientific data capture of these tests. As well as this, I have also run through the PID calibration for my machine, which is simple enough through the control menu on the Prusa machine. The methodology in setting up these tests is fairly straightforward. I will arrange extruder setup to match each configuration listed in the spreadsheet. Then I will heat up the nozzle to 280 degrees C and make a note of the times as it passes through the target temperatures and input this time into the spreadsheet. And finally, I will repeat the test again, but this time deactivate the printer fan on heat ups, just so we can see what effect this would have in relation to the SOX implementation of heat loss on the various configurations being tested. Okay, so let's just get on with it. Much, much, much later. Wow, that was fun and a bit rewarding, but also the results were very cool and interesting. I'll show you the graph and you can pause the screen and have a look at this and work out the results for yourself before I go in picking out what some of the data means in incorporating these tests. The chart although looks complicated and daunting and I know you're tempted to either unsubscribe or click over to Joel and Angus's channel but just give me a few minutes to explain what we have here. First of all the chart is structured into the combined test parts that we tested involving all the components listed from left in blue to right in pink, more and more copper parts are introduced. Those bars that are marked with the black dashed line indicate that the sock has been included. This is then grouped into pairs of the target temperatures to show results from fan off and fan on. Simple. Now that we can read the graph, what does this data tell us? The first thing we can see within each group is on every test where the sock has been included, it takes a little more time to heat up. I bet you guys, like me, thought that the sock would have speeded up heat at times. But the sock has mass as well, that also requires heat energy, which in turn will take a little longer for heating up the heater block assembly. The other obvious result is, as we introduce more and more copper into the heater block assembly and set higher temperatures, it takes longer for the heater block assembly to achieve its target temperature. Which again makes sense, seeing as we've already sat through our science class on thermodynamics and found that mass density has a big effect on heat conductivity and copper is much more dense than aluminium. Another surprising fact from these tests, certainly for me, was that the default aluminium brass combination proved to be the fastest for heat up time than any other combination. However, if this combination is the fastest at heat ups, then it can be equally the fastest to cool down or lose thermal energy. And this could arise to thermal fluctuation, especially at higher temperatures due to its high specific heat capacity performance. A real problem when dealing with high temperature materials. The risk for longer and larger prints is that your print could be 80% through and it takes only one layer for the nozzle to fluctuate its temperature and for that layer to fail before the whole print is confined to the failed parts bin. So actually what we need to minimize is the instabilities and achieve consistent thermal performance from the extruder assembly during prints. So to summarize, if you're looking for the best thermal performance from your extruder during prolonged print runs at higher temperatures with the consistency in quality print after print, then E3D's copper parts are really the way to go and thus this type of setup may be better suited for much more higher temperature materials at 300C and above such as PMMA, polycarbonates, peak and the like. 
but some of you may criticize the high cost of these parts. The fact that the raw material of copper can be more than three times the price of aluminium, this shouldn't be a cause for concern. It's also crucial to bear in mind that the parts are also nickel plated to provide non-stick surface and to some extent this does work, whereby the molten plastic tends to gather together like droplets and then can be wiped off easily using a kitchen towel and some isopropanol when the heater assembly is heated to its working temperature. Finally, if you're not convinced but still want the best of both worlds, you could then at the very least make full use of E3D's copper nozzles at 0.4mm using the standard aluminium heater blocks and incorporate the sock, as I found this setup to be the best all-round performer for medium to high-end temperatures. Well, I hope you enjoyed this more scientific review of E3D's copper components and I would like to thank the team at E3D for giving me this opportunity to have an in-depth look at these products and prove the theory more scientifically. Knowledge and experience were shared and what's more valuable than that. As always, thank you and see you on the next episode.